I, I am Scott Morrison and I own a company called Bright Star Life Care. Uh, we have locations in Gainesville and in Duluth and we cover as far south as Clayton County and uh, as far north as Rabin. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about Bright Star before we get into the uh, transitions. Our founders, J.D. and Shelley's son, they had a grandmother that lived with them. They're from Gurney, Illinois, and the grandmother developed cancer, and she needed someone to come into the home and help while they both worked. Uh, Shelley was a CFO, J.D. was a stockbroker, and uh, they went through eight different agencies before they finally found someone that they felt comfortable with coming into their home. And they basically said, you know, there's a need here. And when they analyzed it, what was missing was compassion. People would quote pricing without asking her name. They would quote pricing without asking, what is it that you're looking for? Let me help you understand state law about the different categories of caregivers and what they can and can't do. And so they founded our a home care company. It's now a national franchise and we have 255 locations in four countries. We're in Australia, Great Britain, Canada, and the U.S. And this one's a little complicated slide so I'm going to go ahead and get it up. up. Come on. The arrows? Yeah. So we do, most of the competitors I have do these two categories. They do companion care and personal care, but at Bright Star we also do skilled nursing. It is the highest licensure that you can obtain from the state of Georgia. Um, basically, with companion care you can help with IADLs, cooking, cleaning, errands, that sort of thing. Uh, with personal care you're actually touching someone. That's an ADL. It's bathing, grooming, toileting, dressing. And then with the skilled care, that is maintaining something affiliated with uh, a health disease state, um, like infusion or blood draws or uh, quadriplegic care, wound care, so on and so forth. <coughs> sure. So with the, the personal care, they don't give you any medication? Is that they don't well, they can remind you to take it. However, since you opened that door, this past summer as part of an aging in place initiative, our legislatures here in the state of Georgia finally got it. They said, why can we train a family member who may not have even graduated high school to do all these tasks, but we can't train a CNA? And so they launched the proxy caregiver initiative. And the proxy caregiver rule basically says that Anything you could train a family member, a CNA can now be trained to do. There are very few agencies doing it. I am one of them. It required that we go out and obtain the TOFLA test, which is a health literacy test. Any CNA that wants to be a proxy has to pass the TOFLA test. It's not that difficult. It's basically, here's a medicine bottle. It says give it four times a day. First dose was at seven. When would you give it again? That sort of thing. Um, then. For every patient that you are doing whatever, so let's say it's feeding tubes and you're pushing crush meds, so on and so forth, you must be in service by a registered nurse on that patient specifically. The family signs documentation that says they waive any holding responsible for the doctor that wrote the order or the nurse that did the in-service. They also say that they recognize that this is normally a skilled nursing procedure, but for cost reasons, they have elected to use a proxy. And as part of that, that's part of the Aging in Place initiative, and so you can stay in your home. You know, you're being discharged from the hospital with a feeding tube. You don't have a family member to do it, but you can't afford skilled nursing to come in three times a day. Now, the home health nurse would come once a day, but you can't just eat once a day. And so if you can afford a CNA, you can now go home and have this, it also affects like trach suctioning, Lovenox shots for heart failure, B12 shots, so on and so forth. The one area that we have not gotten into, it is part of this, is insulin. 
and that is because it's a dose escalation and even if the blood sugar doesn't come down you're not authorized to take an order from a doctor over the phone to now give another insulin shot. Um, I do have one client that she is uh, 49 living with autism and she's diabetic but her blood sugar is always low so whenever it's low we call the mom and she says give her a cookie so Nice. So I've asked, uh, actually Tim Johnson had pointed out that, and this will go beyond just the home care side, but it had pointed out that we at Georgia Tech who don't have medical expertise need to better understand the different levels of care and he's offered to do a put together a workshop or a training session where he can, his group could educate us on that as well as anyone else who's interested. So. Okay. Well, if you need an extra speaker, I'm always yeah. available. Uh, uh, we've got to organize it. Okay. Also, we can, we can provide you care wherever you live. It does not matter. You're in an independent living, you're in assisted living, you live in your home, uh, even at the hospital we do care. Would you go to the marina and someone live on the boat? Yes. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I have a caregiver this morning flying to Arkansas to, trans to accompany a uh, elder back here to move into assisted living near her family. So we do all sorts of stuff. Uh, we're available same day and you get us 24-7. And just so... Hold for a second, Scott. So if somebody's in an assisted living, why should they sign on with your company rather than with the company within the assisted living. Okay. CNA. Assisted livings are all for profit mm -hmm. and if something happens from nine to five they always have enough personnel to take care of it but they're always understaffed nights, weekends and holidays. So if you were theoretically uh, discharged from the hospital and you're medically fragile and you can't make it to the bathroom but the, theoretically you're going to improve over a period of a couple of weeks with physical therapy they may hire us to come in just at night to help you go to the bathroom and that sort of care or if you're being discharged from the hospital and you have a feeding tube the assisted livings don't want anything to do with that but they would love to keep you as a resident well the family would then pay my caregiver to come during days and stay with them and help them to the bathroom but then also administer their feeding so you offer services that the ALs don't okay. right we partner with the ALs and so that's that's important too as we're making our plan for aging in place that we realize that you know a lot of folks think okay we're going to put mom in this assisted living and that's going to be that well that's not necessarily so you know she may require things that the state of Georgia won't allow that assisted living to do and so she technically should go to skilled nursing which the family would find cost prohibitive So our staff they're very qualified and compassionate we screen them we certify them we background check them and just to show you some of the screening practices <clears throat> in addition to in-depth interview and national licensure and criminal background checks that are at the national state and local level uh, we monitor we have software that monitors everything that could expire 30 days prior to expiration we notify the caregiver they have 30 days to correct it if they do not we cannot deploy them, deploy them. It will block them from going. So if your CPR is expired, too bad you can't go work. Uh, we do the reference checks, state health screening, is negative TB, so on and so forth. And I'm one of the few companies out there that has a competency lab. I have the entire hospital set up in a room. So if you sit in an interview and tell me you can operate a Hoyer lift, we're like, come with me. And we start with, how do you wash your hands? and it goes through the whole you do vitals I got the dual head t stethoscope you uh, we have a, a mannequin that is interchangeable male and female parts if you're skilled nursing what you say you can do catheterization you're going to show us if you say you can do IV we've got that set up I've got the bedside toilet the walker the oxygen everything in one room and so we competency you before we ever offer you a job now what that does it establishes the baseline for the caregiver so now we've got something to work on because we do continuing education it also means to the client we're never putting in someone in there that's in over their head with the task at hand and 24-hour support someone's always on call 
We're one of the few companies, we actually have this as a sales mark, we, we guarantee compatibility. So if for any reason you don't care for your caregiver, it does not matter. We replace them, no questions asked. Give you an example, I had a 96-year-old retired librarian. We were living with her. Department of Labor says that if you live with someone, you have some free time. Well, after the first day, she called me and said, Scott, I want somebody who likes to read. I said, let me get this straight. You want someone to read to you? No, during the free time, I'm going to be reading. I want someone who also likes to read rather than watch TV or play on their computer or what have you. So we replaced them and we've been with this lady a year and a half. So. And these are some of the things <clears throat> we do the performance reviews after you've been there a week, uh, every third quarter, and at the end of each assignment. And I'm kind of blazing through this stuff because I want to get to the pathways. Uh, we do often have bilingual staff. Uh, being in Duluth, I have Korean caregivers, Hispanic caregivers, from the islands caregivers. It's like the United Nations working for me. Um, And the other interesting piece is we do any, it does not matter how old you are. My youngest clients are eight week old twins, my oldest clients 103. So anywhere you fall along the continuum of care, we have caregivers for you. I think that the case that represents us the best, we lived with a lady for a year. She had a medical event when she came home from the hospital, she was on hospice. I had nothing to do with that, but as it turned out, the hospice that she had, I had the staffing contract for continuous care. So when she went on continuous care, my nurses did the continuous care. The social workers at the hospice knew I did child care, and during the funeral, we took care of 20 kids and had all the food set up for them when they came back. So it's literally from one end of the continuum to the other, no matter what level of care you need, I have caregivers for it. So, um, health care reform. We have gone from fee for service to value based purchasing. And it is, it mandates that it must be patient centered, which I argue with this. I'm much more of a person centered uh, person. That's the right terminology. Uh, high quality. You can shorten it just put P centered. Right. <laughs> and then delivered efficient, efficiently. So, all the hospitals, all their data, all their admissions, all their readmissions, everything about them is tracked. And now the public has access to that information so that they can see what your, what by disease state, how do you perform. And so this is part of uh, the PPACA and it also is going to affect reimbursement. For 30 years I was in medical diagnostics and I managed a huge sales force and our motto was pay plan dictates behavior. Well this has now come to medicine. Um, no more will you sit there for, as a physician for five minutes and, and maybe or maybe not hear what's saying because it's not only the hospital it is the physician, it is the rehab, it is the home health agency, it is the, assist, the uh, skilled nursing facility, the physical therapists, all of them. If you get a check from CMS, you're now affected by this. And so all of a sudden, everybody's very interested in these outcomes. Well, what if healthcare reform is, is you know, is repealed? It really doesn't matter. What a lot of folks in the common populace don't realize is we've been working since the mid-90s on reforming health care. There have been all these pilot studies going on and all these best practices accumulated and no matter what happens in the next election, a lot of this is here to stay. It's already law. And so, and I believe that the hospitals are truly concerned about patient outcomes. We've got a silver tsunami about to hit the system. There's 75 million baby boomers that are about to hit the system and there's not enough anything. And we need to have wellness programs and, and health focused programs so that people can live longer and live uh, comfortably. You know, used to, you had a medical event and you passed away. Well now, they save you. And they say, you know, pat us on the back to the family. We saved you. Now here they are. Go take care of them. And the family's like, 
Well, we don't even live in the same state with them anymore. We used to live five miles down the road. So all of this is playing into it. So it's all about 30-day readmission. That's where they put the stake in the ground. They said, we're going to look at three different disease states to start with. Eventually, there'll be 10. It's going to be heart failure, MI, and pneumonia to start with. And we're going to look at those and we're going to track you versus your peers and wherever you fall in an audit later on above the curve all the money we set aside for this you will get your money back plus some unfair share of those who fall below the curve. So here's a typical hospital just for this example St. Andrews they see 1200 heart failure patients a year but their readmission rate is higher than the national average and so They've got $50 million in a fiscal year that they get from CMS and reimbursement. And in the first year, 2013, there's a half million dollars of penalty available or at, at risk, a million, a million and a half. This is a problem and this is what gets the attention at the C-suites at the hospital. And the cost of the readmission. Right. And it's tracking readmission. doesn't matter whether you went to another hospital. Ah. Okay. If you came into a medical uh, facility and were admitted for the same thing. Now, let's say you spent 10 days in the hospital for heart failure, and then you went home and fell and broke your hip. That doesn't count. Okay. You're being readmitted for, for a hip replacement. Yeah. But... If you went home and did not comply, compliance is the biggest issue and we'll get into how we affect compliance. But if you didn't comply, then you could literally have a revolving door situation where you're just going home and coming back to the hospital and going home and coming back to the hospital. And that has to cease. So is that, gonna, is that going to affect uh, hospitals admitting people? Exactly. That are high risk for non-compliance and, and, and have a number of uh, risk factors for being readmitted even if they do comply. They, if they have the bed, they have to admit them. So uh, this is a very critical issue and certainly the, the, the transition of care is now the flavor of the day. What happens after that person leaves the hospital? And that's where Bright Star comes in, and I'll share with you how we do that in just a moment. So, anyway, but I don't understand the, the, the function of the penalty. Pay plan, pay plan dictates behavior, okay? If, you're, if you've got millions of dollars that are at risk that you could have had, then, and someone else is going to get that, because you rank below the curve, then you've got to put in programs and policies and partnerships throughout the community so that you get safe transitions and you get the affected outcomes that you need. You're always going to have non-compliant clients. And of course, you're documenting that all along the way. Uh, but for the majority of them, it's simply ignorance. Think about it. As a culture, we are trained from birth that I'm sick, I went to the doctor, I got better. Well, when you get a chronic disease, you're still, that's ingrained in your mind. Well, I went to the hospital. I'm going to get better. Well, no, you got to go home and change your life. You've got to do what they said for you to do. And for a lot of folks, I've had clients that say, oh, I'm going to eat healthy. I've got some Progresso soup right here, and I pull it out, 850 milligrams of sodium. They think that because it's soup, it's healthy. No, we need to start with carrots and celery and chicken and, you know. I thought it was the reverse, like, <clears throat> I wait until the last possible minute to go to the doctor to help me get better. For men, that's correct. Men tend to, <laughs> men tend to avoid physicians <laughs> at all. <laughs> that's right. But, but women tend to stay on top of things. It's just a matter of, once again, there's that ignorance at the common population level about what to do after you've been diagnosed. And they're so busy at the hospital and so busy at the physician's office lab, they really don't have the time to sit there and drill down with you as to what this means and teach you. And that's where our heart failure program comes this in. This is one of the hottest issues right now is that hospitals running scared. There's a disconnect between people being discharged from the hospital and what happens at home and so hospitals are looking to beef up their discharge planning and, and the whole care transition. And yes, John. So, hitting them where it hurts in the back. You know. 
And, and I know we've talked about this, but it seems to me that, and, and obviously the point here is getting towards hospitals moving out into the community and keeping people at home, but um, it seems to me that they also could figure out that it's going to be cheaper for them to keep them there at all costs and not readmit them, and people not getting readmitted when they actually need to get readmitted. Well, the and and that's counter that's counter to the uh, entire Hippocratic oath and the and the fact that right. Um, well, but the, yeah, I mean, it, you got to tell on yourself. You know, it's just like Emory announcing yesterday we've lost three hundred thousand medical records. Yeah, I mean, it what them, a. It took, this, this is a critical thing. It took them two months. We got a letter yesterday. It took them two months to notify anybody. Right. Right, because right. they had so, to figure out what all they had to do. Right. And they're going to pay for everybody to have their, their credit score maintained now. Uh, this is a great website, hospitalcompare.hhs.go, um, that you can look up any hospital and get their data. Oh, gov. <laughs> gov. Sorry. I need to correct my PowerPoint. So the, uh, the data collection is from HCAH. PS and uh, this reduction in potential eligible incentive dollars is real critical. So um, for hospitals, they have this survey for the Medicare Home Health. They have the HHCAHPS for the ILFs, the ALFs, and the SNFs. They have Gallup and other polls. Uh, I am monitored by Press Ganey because I am Joint Commission accredited. I'm one of the only home care companies servicing North Georgia that has gone through this painful process of getting accredited. But what it says to the consumer is we're laser focused on quality improvement and quality assurance and we have our meetings and if we have an issue we hit it head on and address it and we've got policies and procedures for everything. State of Georgia says that for some cases I can go as long as 90 days and not have my nurse go back into that home. My le most lenient cases are 60 days under joint commission. And if you're critically, fr if you're fragile, we're in there sometimes once a week, but at the minimum every 30 days. So uh, here's our hospital compare. Uh, patient satisfaction data. So you look in the surveys and you can tell and they're compared to all their different peers. And this is just comparing the hospital survey between Press Ganey. Um, you know, during this hospital stay, how often did nurses treat you with courtesy and respect? Uh, during your stay, how often did nurses listen carefully to you? Uh, but Press Ganey, before giving you any new medicine, how often did the hospital staff describe possible side effects? Uh, during this hospital stay, did doctors, nurses, or other hospital staff talk with you ahead uh, about whether uh, you would have have the help you needed when you left the hospital. These are all critical pieces that are now uh, affecting your scores. Is Press Ganey is proprietary to Brightstar? Right? Uh, Press Ganey is, most hospitals also use Press Ganey, uh, but it is a specific to Joint Commission. If you're Joint Commission accredited, you must participate in that survey. What happens in, in my situation is 10% uh, of our clients every month get this blind survey. I'm very proud of our 94% approval rating. Most hospitals, if they're getting 80, they're doing really good. And uh, so that's what we're currently running at is 94%. 10% of your clients received this survey? That's what correct. What percentage actually complete the survey? Uh, if, if 50 are sent out, we get about 17 back. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times it's also going to it's going to the payer source, which is the daughter or the son or whoever who is checking in with mom every day about how did it go with the caregiver. So we've we've created these value added clinical programs. Uh, the first one is uh, our hands program. I'll go through that very quickly, and then our clinical pathways, and then of course we do life care, kid care, and we do staffing. Everything that we have developed here is evidence-based, okay? I've given you all the different referral sources in the handouts, and uh, these are best practices. Uh, Howard's very familiar with our latest acquisition at Bright Star Corporate. Her name is Sharon McGuire. Sharon is one of the leading, the, one of the thought leaders 
as a geriatric nurse practitioner and she is highly regarded throughout the nation and she has compiled and put together these clinical pathways for us to implement. And so it's research based. I'm sure all of you will appreciate that. Um, and we, we best utilize the best practice approach to following national quality standards because we are Joint Commission accredited, evidence-based programs, and then state-of-the-art technology. And I'm sure that all of you are thinking of different technologies that can be used to help get this information in the hands of the physician so that you can have a successful discharge and avoid readmission in 30 days. And we'll talk a little more about that shortly. So HANS, it is our hospital accelerated nurse discharge service. It's transitional. We'll pick you up at the hospital with a CNA who will then take you home and our registered nurse will meet you there and quickly assess your home. See this clutter right here? We need to move it. It's a fall risk. Uh, you don't have enough lighting here. We need to address that. Um, all and so on. So assess the entire environment. Now we're going to also Call your doctor and get that appointment for the in three days, which you need to see a physician, your PCP or your cardiologist or whatever, within 72 hours after discharge. And then so we do the medication reconciliation. You just had a hospital event. You're probably not coming home on the meds that you went to the hospital on. So reconcile those, move the others away. If you're using a doser, reload the doser, get it all set up for you so that you are compliant and then educate you on your new disease state and any of the red flags that you need to be aware of if you insist that you no longer need help you're going to manage this on your own until home health can get in there because I'm not a Medicare agency so if it's a Medicare patient home health has 72 hours to get in there this kind of fills that gap the hands, hands program Scott? yes so how far do you, do you take the home assessment um, beyond the sort of the obvious and the clutter and stuff and to a full-blown it's a full-blown plan of care where's the water cut off where's the gas cut off what's the exit plan in case of emergency are there animals what are their names are they small making sure that we know not to send a caregiver that's allergic to a dog or a cat or now I have to ask if you have feather pillows or feather comforters because I had a caregiver that anaphylacted changing a bed um, but it is but if you had somebody that you know that was in a chair and the chair didn't go through into the bathroom and the doors need to be widened or they need crab bars and that is where there, my nurse is calling me because I'm part of the National Aging in Place Council and I know every resource out there like Dennis and go in and remodel and, and get that turned around very quickly. Um, and, and sometimes it, it is just the, the ignorance of the folks. You know, the, the problem is, and just to sidebar, 75% um, of us will live wherever we are at age 65 until we cannot. So, at age 65, we need to be in the place that we can live to be 100. So it needs to have the wide doors for a future power chair. It needs to have front-loading washers and dryers and blocking for grab bars. You don't have to put the grab bars in, but have that done. Have your microwave at, at waist level rather than up here where you're going to pour hot soup on yourself. If you have a finished basement, pour a sidewalk around so that for that future power chair. Putting all that thought process into place at age 65, guess what? If you've got long-term care and you've addressed your financial piece and you've addressed your spiritual piece, whatever that means to you, it doesn't make a darn what happens to you. You can stay right there at your house. But I see so many clients that are 87 living in a three-story house. Oh, we don't use the two upper levels. But the doors on the lower level are so narrow, they are literally one fall away from having to move. And then they can't figure out why. I'll agree with you on everything you said except the 65, because you need it when you're 25 or when you're 35 or 45. Or well, then universal design, right. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I just was curious as to... Um, but they do. My nurse will call me and say, this is an unsafe, or we'll call back the hospitalist 
and and tell them this is not a safe environment. But is it part of the standard assessment when they're being discharged home, so for, for heart failure, that they would look at how well the person is doing activities of daily living if right. they have grab bars in the bathroom? Well, and in fact, you do it right. before they go home because it, you know, I mean, the biggest issue is, you know, I've done a lot of work with workers' comp is they call you two days before discharge and you go out there and you, they need a ramp and so they can't even get in the house. Right. You know, so do you do it, you know, do you go in before they get home? We do it as do soon as we get that referral. Yeah. Now, case management at some facilities, well, she wants to go home now. <laughs> And we try to fulfill that because we do have the people piece of it. It's just a matter of getting that nurse out to do the, the reconciliation and and also the you know our checklist and light meal prep and and even even phone calling loved ones and let them know hey this person just had a medical event and they're home and you need to know about it. Is this whole hands process that's that's up there right now? Is this all private pay exclusively? Yes. Can I clarify that? Yes. The Medicare and third-party insurance does not pay for, especially in the state of Georgia, anything considered custodial care. They will pay for a nurse to come and visit you to treat a wound, to and, and home health, they will pay for medication reconciliation, but they've got 72 hours to get there. So it's up to you to try to figure out. You know, a lot of times you come out of the hospital with a staff of prescriptions this thick. Well, we'll take you to wherever you get your prescriptions filled and get them filled for you and then the nurse is going to meet us there and reconcile all this. Um, but that's, I have a related question. How this is this offer to, you know, the patient? Through educating those who are discharging at the hospital. Now I do have, and, I, and we'll get to that, where I have partnerships with hospitals for the uninsured where it's much less, it's, it's much, much less costly for them to pay me to go do this than it is to risk that tomorrow that patient's going to come back through the emergency room. And we'll go through that in just a moment. Is there any hospital today that, 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 that is either willing or able just to, to do, do the hands thing all themselves? Just yes. Um, actually, uh, probably one of the premier heart uh, hospitals in Georgia is Northeast Georgia Hospital in Gainesville and they have an entire program they'll take you shopping and teach you how to read labels and the other hospitals are working on it but so how are you gonna I mean those are your competitions how are you gonna actually there's because of the volume they can't do everything, you know, okay, well first you got to get home, you got to reconcile, now you've got to sign up for this class to come back. I mean, it's through classes and so forth. Well, that's provided that you feel like it. Because we're talking about most of these folks are over 65, living with um, three co comorbidities and needing help with at least three IADLs and two ADLs. Those are the types of patients that this is really targeted for. It's not necessarily your 50 year old heart failure patient that's got a support group of huge family and everything else. But it could be. So who are our other hands clients? It's private pay clients. It's families that are out of state and can, you know, they've got multiple roles they've got to do. They might give it as a gift to a loved one. Multiple birth moms. We do a lot of uh, postpartum depression and, and they don't know how to take care. I was thought I had one and now I got three and what do I do? And they're all on different schedules. We'll go in and, and teach them and we'll take care of the kids one day and then the next day we'll supervise while the mom takes care of the kid and we'll clean her house and cook dinner for the husband. So, you know, however that plays out. And I've got a lot of church groups that pay me to go do that. Um, also as concierge service, Plastic surgery centers, you, your insurance will not pay for that care, but now you're all wrapped up and you need somebody to change your bandages and make sure everything's okay until you get to your next appointment. And then the Medicare home health agencies are a great referral source for me because I do everything they cannot do by business model. Do you have any other demographics like who can, for example, afford these? Um, I know that you explained to us who uses, but well, and there also are, are there also are 
programs through uh, the state, through Medicaid, like CCSP and Source and what have you, that these programs can be incorporated into a plan of care. Um, I currently am a preferred provider for the Veterans Administration for their home health aid program where we go, it's kind of a milk route, the CNA will have six people they go see for two hours each and during the time they're doing these things and others are helping with the bath or, or the, you know, helping the primary caregiver so that they don't have to worry about this stuff. Um, so we've got all sorts of materials that go with the HANDS program. So the purpose of my talk today was to get to clinical pathways. It's condition specific evidence based programs and um, it does enhance quality of life and it does re reduce readmissions. Um, Here's the key part. Active oversight and involvement of a clinical coordinator, this is always an RN, who can talk to a doctor over the phone and get a verbal order. And so, by Dennis, if we're, if we're weighing you every day and we're trending the weight and suddenly you've gained three pounds, well normally that would cause the caregiver to call 911 and you would go back to the hospital. Well in this program, the RN is catching that through technology and then saying we have a weight gain and we need an order, a verbal order for an additional Lasix and the doctor will give it, will give the Lasix, they will then void and the weight loss, the weight gain problems avoided. What technology are you using? Well, we've got, we have multiple technologies. I'm, I've, I'm using Rick and Rick's stuff at HT Care. Uh, there is also Grand Care, there's Cardiocom, I've mentioned all those, there's the Health Buddy, but it's the same principle. You're getting trending reports for weight, pulse oximetry, um, blood pressure, uh, glucose, what have you, so that you can see any red flags. And the key part is having that nurse who can see the trends, then call the doctor. So it's primarily the vitals and the weight? I mean, yeah, especially in heart failure. Yeah. yeah. Any kind of ambient environment, you know, motion or, uh, you know, typical day type? Well, your ADLs, if you're not able to do, but they announced today that, um, I heard on the news that just simply cooking is a great physical activity for an elder living with dementia. Right. Um, so we're, we are, we establish baselines very quickly of what your abilities are and we try to help you obtain optimal health. The physical therapist is going to main, is going to run the exercise program if in their best judgment it's okay for our caregiver to do the range of motion exercises then it is incorporated in the care plan because they'll only come two or three days a week and on the other days we'll run you through the same exercise so that you can optimally get your weight, your uh, balance coordination and muscle mass back. Yes? So do you have a an idea of how much time it takes the RN to uh, to call through all the data, um, and how much and how often are they are they monitored? How often is the data coming in? Yes. Right on the vitals, and how often do the data comes in each time that there's something done? The coordinator, our new software ABS2 which is Athena business system software trends it right. and will generate all the graphs and so forth. The coordinator then is monitoring this stuff and if necessary we have cleared the pathway with the physician that if we call you're going to answer your phone. Right, but how much time does it take, take the RN to look at all the trends that the computer is generating? It doesn't take five minutes if you've got the, the, tr the reports done for you. Yeah, it, it's a snapshot. It's easy. You have a dashboard where you can see multiple things at once and you can have right. a So I'm trying to get an, a feel for how, the system, how this whole system works. So okay, and I'm going to get to that. Are you do it at a certain time during the day or are there red flags that the computer will pop out? Both. Alarms Both. And shoot, you know, shoot. But the whole package, I'll show you what the entire package, okay. we're going to get there. Um, so who benefits? Clients, families, hospital systems, Medicare, home health, skilled nursing, the primary care providers, and your specialists. And so 
the clinical pathway coordinator goes, goes through special training. We focus on empowering people to manage their own disease state. It's usually just an education thing. Um, our staff are certified to go through the different, to know the modules. Um, we give them a pathway guidebook um, and then special documents. You know, they're all client centered, referral oriented, condition specific. Um, Care Together, we have advanced clinical training, and then Care Together is a website that we have where you can go in and create a space for the individual. The only people who have access to it are those who you invite. It is HIPAA compliant. Um, I don't have access to it unless you invite us into it. But you can then go in and put in updates. You can put in the calendar so they can see who the caregiver is that day. Also, you can say, hey, don't forget, next week's her birthday. Everybody send her a card. I took her to the task list. I took her to the doctor last week. It's your turn next week. Her appointment is at whenever. She's just been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Upload all the blogs about Parkinson's so we know what this chronic disease is and what, what is going to be happening so that that nephew or son that's in California can still participate in mom's care and not suddenly fly here and be just totally disillusioned at the state of decline that she's in, which is what we experience in the care delivery area, is their hands off until there's a crisis and they fly in on the white horse and then it's our fault, you know, because mom's in the state of decline. Whereas if you had been participating for three years, you would have known that she had this disease and what it was going to happen. Is this just for your no. client? No, this is open free to anybody. Photos, videos, interfaces with smartphone, Twitter, Facebook, everything is called caretogether.com. And I don't have, I've given out so many of these, I've ordered new ones, I don't have enough to hand out. I've got a lot of children living with aut autism who are clients on this, as well as Down syndrome, because they've got multiple relatives out there that want to be able to participate in their care. Oh, this is more our sales aids. So, now, clinical pathways materials. We've got, and I gave you a copy of this. This goes as a magnet on the refrigerator. How do I know my heart failure red alert flag? I'm doing well when my weight's not changed, my breathing's normal, and I can do normal activities. Caution, I'm going to call who. What, what number, if I've had a weight gain of X pounds in number of days, I have more shortness of breath or dyspnea, more swelling of the feet, ankles, legs, or belly, feeling more tired. I'm calling 911 if I have severe shortness of breath, chest pain that doesn't go away, confusion or can't think clearly. This little thing is best practices nationwide and it's great education at, at a very layman's terms for folks to participate in their heart failure. Is that just paper or is that online? That's uh, available online as well. I can get you that. Um, no, I mean as far as the way that they respond to it, has anyone done that? No. Um, no. Person facing. <laughs> uh, Bright Star Heart Failure Knowledge Guidebook. So you've had heart failure, well we give you all the education in layman's terms that you need in order to understand is it uh, diastolic heart failure, is it systolic heart failure, so on and so forth. And we go through this with you because you just had a 10 day experience in the hospital. You don't feel very well. They hand you six inches of paper and say go change your lifestyle. Well. We take that six, six inches of paper and help you understand it and what it means and how can we address this issue. Um, you know, you can't eat dill pickles anymore, that sort of thing. Also, we have uh, what happens during a heart failure visit, um, and that's from the CNA standpoint, also from with the whole decision tree. This, once again, is based on best practices for the nurses. And SBAR is nationally accepted protocol for reporting about to a physician about a decline. And so we describe the situation, we give them the background, we give them the nurse's assessment, and then whatever recommendations we have. Who and this is what together for you. And, and the coordinator. And and a lot, you know, like you, you say, a lot of this evidence based who keeps up on on the new evidence. That That's where Sharon McGuire comes in. That's her entire job out at Bright Star as she's developing. This is the first one. 
The next one will be MI, the third one will be pneumonia, then we're getting into hip replacement, then Alzheimer's dementia. The top 10 things that are causing readmission. And as she does that, she will, Sharon will be updating these protocols. What, what were the next ones coming up? Uh, the, the first three are uh, heart failure, uh, pneumonia, and myocardial infarction. And then later there is uh, hip replacement and uh, Alzheimer's dementia and I can't remember the rest of them. So but there's ten total. So because this is, mo you know, Bob is focused on, tech you know, design and technology, is there information outside of you going in at the beginning and looking at their home and, and doing some recommendations or modifications, is there more information that you can give them or are giving them about technologies that are available or resources to go and look at technologies? I am, I am, I don't know that all Bright Star owners are. I'm a CSA, so I'm a certified senior advisor and I'm a ready reference resource for everything to do with our elders. And I stay in the sandbox. I'm, you know, active in so many different groups so that I accumulate this knowledge and have it available for the families. It's usually the families who are more interested because the elder still is convinced there's nothing wrong with them and I need everybody to get out of my house. <laughs> um, but the families are more interested in helping them accomplish that desire they have to live in that home and are open to various technologies. And is there like a, you know, you, you're showing us all these resources that you can give, you know, handouts and stuff you can give them. Is there something that you've called together that you could also give somebody, you know, with dementia versus, um, you know, heart, you know, chronic heart disease, COPD, you know, that different things to expect that they might be able to do to their homes or the kinds of technologies they might need? Or the references for those individuals, like if I refer to Dennis or I refer to My Accessible Home, they've got the licensed clinical folks that can come in and actually get down in the the dirt with them because I'm kind of here at the 50,000 foot level offering them those resources but to have a list specific no I haven't okay so that's something we can talk about well yeah I'm, I'm trying because I can't see all of the little yeah I understand uh, these are just some of the different things, technology uses, from monitoring to med dispensers. I will tell you, I've evaluated three different med dispensers. I still haven't found one that's ideal for a heart failure patient, and it's because they all have these little pinhead pi pills that jam them. And as long as your pills are, are huge, it works great. But some of these that involve heart failure, They've got these little minute pin, uh, pinhead pin, pills that uh, cause the things to fail. Well, what kind of dispensers are these? Obviously, they're mechanical. Something. They're mechanical, right? That you know, at a certain time, it offers you the alarms go off and the tray comes out and it monitor. If you if you don't take it, so it pulls it back safe. in. Right, tab safe. Okay. And mm -hmm. then, have you done? Have you tried the MD2 from Philips? No, I haven't cups? seen that one. These little cups that you fill. Dispensing yeah. at the right time, but you know it has drawbacks too. You've got big cups and little meds and lots of space wasting. Gotcha. Um, so the essentials package, which is if you're less than two uh, comorbidities and probably only two ADLs, then you're going to get in week one. You're you're going to get the clinical pathway coordinator within 12 hours of discharge. You're going to get um, the phone call the first week they're going to call you three times and the caregiver is going to come in daily. Weeks two and three you've got uh, the clinical pathway coordinator visiting once a week, the RN clinical pathway coordinator phone call twice per week and the caregiver in there three times a week and then week four it goes to one, one and two. Now this one the Essentials Plus package that is five RN coordinator visits, 13 phone call or virtual visits and 17 CNA visits. <coughs> those are for those who are medically fragile. Usually three comorbidities, three ADLs, three IDLs. These are the folks that are very fragile. How does home health 
figure into that timeline too. So you're overlapping because you're providing them mm -hmm. actual medical right. care. And then they're just doing And we partner with them because if they're some many home health agencies have developed similar things for their patients that are on Medicare. Okay. And they too are partnering with the hospitals. But the issue becomes you're uninsured, you're underinsured, home health can't come see you because you don't have insurance. But the hospital is still dinked if you come back through that emergency room door. They, CMS doesn't care whether you're Medicare or not. They are just tracking the disease state. So that's where it comes for the hospital to pay me to go do this and keep them out of the hospital for 30 days so that they free up beds and get revenue generating patients in there. So. Just real quick, what is heart failure in the elderly? Um, it is a public concern. Um, it's associated with higher rates of mor morbidity. If you look, median survival is two and a half years, uh, with 25% of the patients dying within one year. And it, here's the big issue. With elderly patients, they're not your normal presenters. And so uh, although they're panting and they have fatigue, they're more likely to have atypical symptoms and they have poor executive functioning and altered mental status and often depression. And that often is because where they were living, they were isolated, they were bored, and they were helpless, which is a cultural issue that we all have to address. So this just shows you between the Essentials Program and the Essentials Plus, how does a four-week total look? Four, eight, 13, total of 25 touch points versus 35 for someone that's very fragile. This is Sharon, but uh, we give this also to our clients, a, a bio of our Director of Nursing, what their experience is, where they are, and as you can see, she's got quite a few uh, She's where? She is in Gurney, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Well, she per virtually lives on the road as she's going out, rolling this out to all the is it price really stores. No. <laughs> no, that's just an example. <laughs> so, when we built this platform of clinical excellence, we've got the care together, we've got our impact studies, our, our business system will track diagnosis, recent hospitalizations, and reasons for admission and readmission and then some of the other things that we do let me show you this is just some of the, the touch points for a c-suite in a hospital they get improved revenue they free up beds they have cost savings and fewer penalties from Medicare improved performance and uh, the improved communication because a lot of home care companies are not even going here um, so these are our other value driven. We have the Charity Care Uninsured Program. That's where the hospital pays me to go do this. Okay. And uh, we're basically an extension of the hospital. We have wound care, IV infusion. Once again, we can do all of this, whether it's peds or elders, all along the continuum of care. I have the caregivers. So what does it save a hospital? About uh, between $1,000 and $1,500 a day. And uh, because it costs 15 to 2,000 for you to be in that hospital for a day, typical cost, and yet 550 for a day, and that includes the medication and supplies. Um, plus, it's additional revenue because they free up beds to get the people with the good insurance in there. We also can dedicate sitters to hospitals so that we've got somebody that can help with your ADLs that frees up the technical staff and the RNs and so forth to focus their care on the other patients. Scott, the estimated 550, is that for a 24 hour day or a 12 hour day? You said the right start process. Well, that's to, for us to go do the home health at the, at the home for them, right. It's a 24 hour day. For to, to do the IVs, because it'd be tw usually your IVs are twice a day, and that's right. two so nursing visits. Is a full 24 hours. That's right. A lot. And have you looked at and tried to figure out in some way cost savings to the hospital for keeping people from being readmitted? I mean, well, the the yeah. Uh, what what happens is is that not only 
are and it's a, it's a sliding scale so 2013 the they're tracking data 2012 the penalties start 2013 it goes up each year after that and what um, where was I going with this well I have I lost the thought. Cost savings to the hospital for, for not having readmissions. Well, they the CMS is dictating it, and they're and they're it is estimated that you will the set asides. Okay, first year it's one percent, second year it's two percent, third year it's three percent. Now that's not only now I remember the thought. It's not only going to affect the ten day original stay, but also the readmission. So all of a sudden, by that patient coming back in, your original 10-day stay, which was very, you ran up a really good bill while you were there, that is affected. And they won't pay you for that readmission. So there's a lot of money on the line. The original 10-day stay is affected how? Well, it is at risk for your payment because they're setting aside, okay, they're, they're taking a percentage of that and they're setting aside and then a year from now they're going to audit you and they're going to see how you fall above or below the curve. Yeah. So we're where expertise and passion cross, value added, cutting edge, person centered care. Any questions? Where Thank you gaps? for your time. Where do you see gaps right now that you think that we as a group could address? That delivery of the data to the clinical coordinator, we've got it in a, it's rather kludgy, okay, because it's just recently rolled out. Um, I'm sure it will improve over time, but right now something's better than nothing because what's happening is they're getting up, their feet are swollen, they've gained five pounds, and boom, here come the emergency personnel whisking them back to the hospital. Now what Northeast Georgia did also is they determined that was a high, high, cause of readmission so they set up an entire clinic for nothing but LASIX so you don't go to the emergency room you go to the clinic and then they set you up on an IV of LASIX and you void and then you go home and you're usually in and out in about two hours versus a whole day experience I mean I would not focus so much on the gap side but I'll make the question what are the needs our you know initiative focus on design and technologies for healthy aging as John was saying so how can design and technologies help you to you know, make your uh, organization better and your services better? Where design and technology you know, can help your needs? Or, or I mean, so a lot of the questions that I was getting at is how can um, design and technology better inform your, your clients? Um, better, they, how can they better use technology to live more effectively in the community as well as it giving you know giving more information to you about them to help them live more effectively. And the challenge that we have is what we had you had discussed earlier when you came in and said they had published this study that all technologies taboo. The Mayo Clinic home monitoring um, increases mortality and um, doesn't decrease rehospitalizations. Wow. Telehealth monitoring is not effective at keeping patients out of the hospital. I haven't read the study yet, just got this. You just got it this phone today, too. Um. And so the knowledge, the, the, the acceptance, that's the big piece. Will the, it's just like all these companies that have all the cameras everywhere. Well, that Big Brother esque mm -hmm. concept isn't embraced by. You know, if, if mom doesn't know it's there, then that's okay. But if she ever found out, boy, she'd be angry, right? Um, and we've got, it, there's, there's kind of this balance between as our a population ages, they are more technologically savvy. It's got to look non-medical and they've got to see what's it, the with them, you know, what's in it for me. Yep. And, and we can come up with all the technology in the world if we can't connect it to that with them for the common populace it's going nowhere so right now it's what's in it for me as a long distance caregiver perhaps but in another 10 20 years it's going to be what's in it for me, for me as period the older me adult. me as the older adult and that's where we're 
we've got to project out to see because what's happening is <clears throat> there's a moratorium on Section 202 housing. Okay, so there is no more funding for senior housing. As they close every tower, these folks are coming back into the community. So the Section 8 housing, the multifamily housing, those sorts of things, which are the highest preponderance of poor eating habits, lack of exercise, what have you. Right now, the managers of those are at a distance. They are not a resource for their residents. Okay, they're like an apartment manager. They might tell you where the grocery store is, but they're not going to tell you who the best of the best is in your area. They're going to have to re train and re and become a coordinator just like you see in the elder housing in our communities we've got to get ready for the fact we're going to be living next door to people who are 90 and 80 and right across the street are the empty nesters and down the street are the 20 year olds with the with a new kid and all of those people how can technology help all of those people interact so that you are a community you are helping each other to succeed because once again I go back to there's not enough anything there's not enough housing there's not enough medicine there's not enough hospitals there's not enough anything for these 75 million people that are living longer and we're saving them and part of the reason too is if you if you go to one of the old cemeteries you see the two big headstones and all the little headstones well childhood disease used to control the population for us well now we inoculate against everything and you just don't see that anymore so the end value of people who have the propensity to reach the hundred and twenty something years that the human body is designed to live without social factors and, and habits and what have you genetics is growing and so you know you see that when when Social Security was invented in 1932 the average age was 58 to put the stake in the ground at 62 and said most people will never get there well now we're at 80 and we're going up and up and up and up and the good news is we saved you the bad news is now here community and family here they are you need to take care of them because Medicare doesn't pay for that so are you, I, I was confused about which particular <coughs> devices you were using um, in this particular study they used. The ideal, I've, I've used Ideal Life with HT yeah. Care okay. through Rick Montgomery and Rick Lozano that are members of this group. Mm -hmm. And so what were your problems? I know when I was um, receiving Health Buddy data, Health Buddy went down a whole lot and I had a hard time getting a data dump from Bosch. Um, they would give me the nice little charts, but I wanted the I wanted the raw data because mm -hmm. we wanted to do other things with it. Um, how do you, what are your problems with your data? How are you receiving it? Well, and this is so relatively relatively new for disease states. We're not. It, I don't have that many clients on this now. Mm. Okay, so this is all cutting edge, brand new stuff. Most of the home health agencies haven't taken it to this degree. They have conceptually said we got a piece of the pie that's in the set aside we've got to res preserve that because they too are dinked if that hospital pay if that patient's readmitted so i'm getting a lot more referrals from the home health agencies saying help because this family thinks we're going to come in and cook and clean and help her bathe and groom and you know if we show up and she sold herself and she needs changing we will change her but we're not coming here to do that and this family has the resources to have you come in and do it and by the way she wants to stay at home it's a real conundrum and it's driven by our culture for looking young nobody wants to see themselves grow old and it's all about planning so what can your what does the technology that you have in the homes now do it's got peripheral devices right that will monitor and trend and but no mo no physiological measures okay. <laughs> also all physiological measures and then I also have caregivers that are there all day every day that can do a lot of the stuff they can physically do the vitals they can physically have you weigh this on the scale and send that data in so that our coordinators are looking at it and saying okay we got an issue so in in thinking about how this Mayo Clinic report could be true how can you imagine that I mean I, and I know this from um, talking with some other folks who are using technology. How do you think that affects your care? So you have a care plan that right now is 
solid, I guess, based on your experience. Well, and there's there's it is person centered and and I don't think you're ever going to alleviate the human element. No, and the, right, right. But you and, should and augment and, <laughs> and augment it. But the the at the level of at the oldest old, they are not a proponent of anything technology being in their home. Okay, so this is actually going to be embraced by. Those of us in the room who are baby boomers who are going to go forward and 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 allow this technology in your home. Um, I have to have some person actively engaged through my agency to a certain level before I can even consider technology. And right. the good thing about your model <coughs> is that you do have a, a care coordinator mm -hmm. RN. With one of the health buddy projects we did, the physicians didn't want to keep getting all these flags. I'm getting these flags. I'm getting these flags. Right. What do you want me to do? You need someone there that can make that decision. To and when we were thinking about this and formulating it, because I sat on the committee with Sharon to help do this, I presented over at the Cab Medical Center, and they said, "You can send me all the red alerts you want to, but then you're going to depend on me to look at my phone and say, oh, I need to call you." There's nothing that replaces <clears throat> your authorized registered nurse who I can give an order to to call and go through the S bar and tell me, here's my recommendation. And then based on my medical knowledge, I'll either accept it or recommend something different, but I'll give you an order as to how we're going to proceed with this patient. And that, that piece, that communication we can trend it all up and get the technology to the RN, but that, that connection between the RN and the doctor has to happen right now as they're trained. So that, I mean, that, that ties into my question about how much time and, and what kind of information they're getting, because I think that what's lacking isn't the, you know, the technology to produce the data, but the system that's effective in having that data interpreted and acted upon. Right. And you're talking about, you know, a, you know, putting in place a system that's different uh, than what's been tried mm -hmm. and what's been done. And it would be really nice to have data on how effective that system is. And we will be tracking it. What your, your anecdotal data is from, mm -hmm. you know, the physicians and Patty's, you know, anecdotal data because there's no real, uh, you know, the health, the health, you know, Mayo Clinic. We don't know what the particulars are about that case, about their their right. study. It could have been, right? Data going to to physicians that they just ignore because they don't really want all that data. Who knows? It could also be a false sense of security in having the system. In so there. I think there's research that's needed yeah. on on the models and developing a really good model for how do we use this this data. And that's that's basically why. We went to just evidence-based, proven stuff to incorporate into this first effort as far as clinical pathways go because the research has been done and we know that this is based on the Coleman model out of Colorado and he has proven that if you do this and this number of visits and this number of RN interventions and this number of caregiver interventions, you will dramatically reduce your hospital readmissions. And so that's now being segued to each disease state and what the particulars are for that. What are you doing for the VA? Are you using any of this? I'm doing the, no, no, we're doing, the for disabled veterans, they are sending us to their home for two hours of home health aid per day, um, every day. And then what we do is we establish a milk route for the caregiver. So you go at 6 a.m. to one place and then at 8.30 to another and then at 11 o'clock to another and then at 1.30 to another and that sort of thing. And then all of the bright stars. See, I, I own three territories. There are 11 in greater Atlanta. So there's other owners like me in Greater Atlanta, but their 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 caseload is much more heavily leveraged personal care than it is the skilled nursing. But my medical background, and it was serendipity in 2008, the state of Georgia, in their infinite wisdom, decided that only an RN could give a flu shot. I had 
42 clinics signed up. I had to hire a bunch of RNs. I had hired all these LPNs. This is when I first opened. And we did it methodically and we went through and said, oh, you do pediatric uh, infusion and you do wound care and you're certified on these wound vacs and you do this and you do that. And so I got this high tech roster of RNs and after flu season I went out and marketed them. So now I do home health for Carecentrix, which is Cigna and Aetna for Coventry Insurance, and then for Blue Cross Blue Shield I do infusion and wound care. So I have my finger in the home health arena, I'm just not Medicare, and I doubt I ever will be because so many of my referrals come from those Medicare reps that are out there saying, help. So for the VA clients today, most of them tend to have caregivers? They have a, they usually have a relative that is their primary caregiver and what we're doing are the hard tasks like the bathing and that sort of thing. Um, many of them are quads or have TBI, traumatic brain injury. I mean, and it's administered through uh, Lucy Parlor's group over there at the, the VA. And, and we, we had tried since 08 to get on the provider list. It was locked out. And then they opened it for a month in January of this year, and we jumped in all, well, all press stars. I mean, actually, it's, it's, it's for a new study that Patty's a PI on that. We need caregiver, care recipient dyads. And one way of... Doing that is that the data exists. <laughs> well, I mean, one way of recruiting them, if you're in their home, you could give them information about the study. Mm -hmm. We can do that. As long as the IRB says we can do that. Exactly. So we have to put it in modification. Well, we have to okay. modify the IRB, but when we've got somebody in the home already, it would be easier than... And every Bright Star location, depending upon their geography they cover, have they're participating in this VA program. Now on the other end of it, I have a lot of clients that receive the aid and attendance benefit from the Veterans Administration and we provide personal care or medication management in their home, wherever home may be. It may be in an independent living, it may be in their home. And we are, and from management standpoint, the VA, we most... That one for a different study for CAT. <laughs> <laughs> the long-term care insurance does not consider medication management an ADL, but the VA does for aid and attendance. But it's true management. There's a lockbox, there's a doser, an RN loads the doser, and the caregiver has the combo, comes at a specific time, opens the doser, is able to say, today is Thursday, it's AM, okay, everything that's in the Thursday, AM, here's a glass of water, you visually watch them take it and you document that they took it. Open their mouth. <laughs> yeah, not, well, we not only need um, subjects, we, we need OTs. Mm -hmm. well. And you had shared that with me the other day, and so I'm, I'm working on that right now to get the OTs that would be able to uh, help. We have a study starting on medication in here, it's and a study starting on caregiver diet. Um, so when can we talk? <laughs> Let's find a time. Yeah, okay. definitely. And one of the other studies that I firmly support is Simple C. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had a, a good experience for, I think it's been a good learning experience for what it didn't do as we rolled it out to the home. And, and that was some of the stuff that was used even to move towards the, the uh, pad, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, these are the kind of, in Claudia, <coughs> kinds of things that we should document more about yeah. DAPA even than the list of who's spoken because we can always ask somebody to speak but the success of DAPA itself is the partnerships and the people getting together it's like when you say when did you talk. you guys hooked up through DAPA <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I met him through DAPA well, and I met you through DAPA I, I met Brian through DAPA and did some some meeting consulting type stuff and that's how Brian got to Ted at Wesley Woods and how a, you know we became closer partnerships with ARC. Okay, so I will soon create a survey for people to send yeah. it to all data so you can give me some feedback on and I can it's about like and Claudia's all writing blur to me. A, uh, a healthcare uh, health reserve quality grant and 
the, the success of Dada has been in these interconnections and documenting what wouldn't have happened, what wouldn't have come about mm -hmm. um, in ter if Dada hadn't been here. Sure. Or, would it, or it likely wouldn't have happened. We might have known people, but it just wasn't that solid connection. Did you bring up was it Rick in or did you? Rick brought me in. What happened is Rick, here's how it all started with, with me and all of this, was Rick was reading the newspaper and I had written an aging in place article as a CSA and he called me and asked if I would come and guest lecture to his class that was working with the ARC Rick on the Duke. Rick Duke. Yeah. That's where I got introduced to this and then the first meeting of Dotha, you remember we had like mm -hmm. 80 okay. people. Yeah. It was, a, it, I mean it was just tremendous that all these folks from television and yes. and everything like that and then it's kind of pared down to more folks who are education inclined and and academic yes. and I think that perhaps pushing it back out to the other folks again may get some influx of new you know re new connections well and I think well, that that's the purpose of the grant Part of the purpose of the grant. What's um, the grant that you're doing? It's a today, actually. We are yeah. trying to uh, run two participatory uh, workshops uh, next year of around 35 people each. And we really want to address the different, you know, diversity of the audience and put them to work together for two intense days through several um, activities to really get into in-depth topics of how we can solve you know, uh, problems related to the issues that we have been talking about here at DAFA. Having been through something very similar to this with the um, silver network that Intel and FNIH are working toward, uh, it was a really cool experience, even for three hours, to sit down with a group of people who have different experiences and brains, you know, pick some topic, that you, some topic from a list they had given us that we had actually identified in a previous meeting, and then brainstorm on one of those topics. And we had four different groups, and each one came back with something different. Mm -hmm. Our group focused on medication and some ideas around that. Initially, it was, you know, well, should we design a new dispenser? And it went more toward, let's look at life and how life functions around the medication. Uh, you know, trying to get more of the patterns um, related to that dosing and stuff. So it, it was kind of an, a neat, um, we even had someone from the VA there talking about the 20, uh, was some crazy number of people in the VA using the health buddy system and how that system could be extended to support this understanding of, of when people take their medications, why they don't take the full dose or what, you know, what challenges they have, et cetera. It was it was really a neat discussion. I'd love to see you know identifying those categories. We could even use some of the same ones that were identified during that workshop to present to this group, and then get together in the ones that we self-identify with.